Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. In the first half of our show, Daryl West from the Brookings Institution shared his views on media polarization. We've invited Mike Gonzalez, Vice President of Communications at the Heritage Foundation, to respond. Mike, you recently wrote a piece in The Federalist titled The New Contras, Understanding the Left's Grip on Media. It was apparently provoked by a Brookings Institution report titled Nudging News Producers and Consumers Toward More Thoughtful, Less Polarized Discourse. We had Daryl West, the co-author of that report, on for the first half of today's show and, uh, and taking to heart his admonition to strive for diversity. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> so, Mike, how could you be against thoughtful discourse and in favor of polarization? I think there are different views of what role government should be able to play in our lives. I think those different views should have an airing. People should hear the two sides and not think that everything is consensus. There are differences between the two sides. When we used to have consensus, when you, we used to have the two parties agree, or I would say collude, on, on things, uh, that's when we saw the, the huge uh, surge in spending. When we had, uh, for example, the amount the government spends on transfer payments go from 30% to around 66% mm-hmm. in the years between the 1940s and today. So I think that it is important that we hear one view and the other and that, that we don't think that they both mean the same. We have two parties for that reason. Mike, you make the case that the Internet has broken the left's control of the, of the media, but the left doesn't accept the premise that they ever had control, and, and many people believe them. So how do you make your case? You know, water is wet. You don't need to have somebody describe why water is wet. I was a journalist for many years, and I can tell you that the newsroom is filled with people who are liberal. I can tell you that uh, the airwaves, uh, until recently anyway, were filled with people who were liberals. We could go into the reasons why that is. <clears throat> Journalists want to change society. Uh, by and large, people who go into journalism want to change society, and people who want to change society are not comfortable with the way society is, so they're not conservative. And we had, until until really talk radio in the late 80s, mm-hmm. and then the Internet put it on, on really on steroids, was we had a, a a rough monopoly of liberalism on the media. We had three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. We, you know, we had uh, anchormen like uh, Walter Cronkite and Harry Reasoner and Frank Reynolds. Very, and they told us good. how it is, right? Well, that's a, I mean, I mean, Walter Cronkite ended his broadcast famously saying, "That's the way it was today, March twenty fourth, nineteen seventy five. Can you imagine that? Anybody attempting today to pretend to have such a monopoly that they can say that's the way it was? Now, especially with the diversity of sources we have now, which the Brookings Institute seems to believe is a threat to consensus. Well, they, they think that because you have different views, we no longer have the comity and the politeness that we used to have. And they have a point, by the way. He used to be a lot more polite, and, and we all knew, I'm, I'm old enough, I'm 53, we all sat around and watched pretty much the same network shows. We, we all knew what Cronkite had said. We all knew uh, what Brinkley had said. That's just no longer the case. People disagree, have fervent disagreements today. You know, I actually think that leads to better governance. And the reason why I say it leads to better governance is because what we had before led to a, a complete ballooning of, of government spending, which I think is a threat to our republic. So this goes hand in hand with the gridlock is good argument. I think I agree with George Will that gridlock is an American gift. It's one of the things that founders left us. They call the checks and balances. We call it gridlock now. It's just different framing. Well, if, if we don't have a national consensus on something, that's a very good indication that we should leave those matters to the states. We should, allow the, we should have 50 laboratories of experiment, and they should be able to seek answers until we have something close to a rough consensus on something, at which, at which point we could pass national legislation. But wouldn't it be the case that fewer and fewer things would achieve consensus over time, and that would mean the government would be doing less and less rather than more and more? Well, to me, that sounds like nirvana. Uh, we do, we should have, uh, we, we do need to have the government have some role in our lives, but it doesn't always need to be the federal government. It can be the state government. It can be the local government. And that's the way, by the way, the Constitution lays it out. It enumerates powers for the federal government. Our federal government today does many things that are not enumerated in the Constitution. 
But we've gotten used to that. I mean, it's been a hundred years of erosion, and now pretty much people take it for granted that the federal government could do anything it pleases. Well, we had FDR respond to a, a real moment of crisis and depression. As, as we know now, uh, a lot of the response to the, to the depression, the New Deal, deepened the depression, made it last a very long time. Uh, it was really the Second World War that got us out of the depression. It was nothing that Roosevelt ever did. The same way we have today with Barack Obama, in which we're in the sixth year of a recession. Now, capitalism, John Maynard Keynes said, has, is supposed to have animal spirits. That means that capitalism gets itself out of trouble. Uh, and we have been in trouble now for five or six years because we have government telling communities what to do. Taking it back to the issue at hand, which is how uh, governments feel empowered by the people to do these things, and looking at the structure of the media, you, you point out in your piece that Twitter is the new AP Newswire. It transmits raw events without comment, context, or, or background. Isn't every journalist taught that it's his job to provide that context to help readers digest the news? Could exposing citizens to undigested information lead to unrest? I don't know where that idea came from. I'm acquainted with it. I used to be a journalist. I used to be a wire service journalist. And you sit in your bureau, let's say in Kathmandu. I've been a, a wire service journalist all over the world. And you, you hear a palace source tell you that the prime minister or the king or the prince is dead. And you send out an urgent, and you say, the prince is dead, a palace source has said. And then you keep renewing that dispatch. You keep adding to it as, as you have more confirmation of what has happened to the prime minister or king or prince. I think that that now is it's going to be in the realm of Twitter and social media. And that is because uh, the prime minister's body will be found in a bathtub somewhere, and it will be found by somebody on his staff whose niece uh, will have access access to Twitter and will tweet about mm -hmm. it. And it will be, that will happen a lot faster than, a, than the AP bureau chief or the Reuters bureau chief or the AFP bureau chief can hear about it. So I think that right now what we have is through social media, we have the access to news a lot faster. Now, that news is not confirmed, and we, the consumers of news now, we, we must be our own filters. It must now be buyer beware. But whose job is it to tell us what to think? Of we ourselves. <laughs> we, have to, we have to be instructed. We have to read the classics. We have to read philosophy. We have to, uh, to pay attention to our own different religions, uh, the Bible, the Koran, whatever religion you happen to be, and seek truth in that, and then apply those truths that are revealed to the news events of today. Uh, that, that, that somebody else would tell us how to think is quite pathetic, I think. Doesn't that take power away from news editors? Absolutely. News editors have been neutered in this context. What they have now is opinion. By the way, the context and explaining what was taking place was always, uh, was always giving something opinion. If you read, for example, a story in the New York Times, it will be angled in such a way, and I don't want to go into it because I don't want to drag any writer into this, but you have a sense of what the writer thinks, what she thinks of the world, or what he thinks of the event that took place. Even a quote-unquote objective news accounting will have always opinion embedded. And I think it's a lot easier now that we know that we're aware of what the opinion of the, of the news emitter is, of the news outlet. Do you think most Americans are aware of how much of their worldview depends on the editorial power of things like topic selection and guest selection and framing in crafting what they hear? Well, thank God, less and less, because a lot of, a lot of things now are being, it's raw news. It, 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 it's news broken down to its simplest form. Right? One example that I give in my article is the death of Whitney Houston. She died in her bathtub in a hotel, and that was just put out on Twitter, or, or the killing of Osama bin Laden. Somebody tweeted that out, and it beat the wires by like half hour, uh, a half mm -hmm. hour. We are no longer dependent on journalists who, by and large, happen to be left of center. Uh, we can go, we can talk mm -hmm. at length as to why that is, but we're no longer dependent on them for raw news. We're dependent on them and on many other people, bloggers and so forth, for context and opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think now what you have is we no longer have a monopoly by the left. 
the Brookings paper spent a lot of time talking about the influence and power of search engines. And they recommended that search engines rank their items not just by popularity or clicks, but by quality. Wh whose job is it to tell Google how to design their search algorithms and who decides what quality is? Well, according to the writers of the paper for Brookings, that quality will, would be judged by the same people who judged news in the 70s and 80s, that is, by left-of-center journalists who would put their spin on things and say, this is quality news and this is not. By the way, this is the same thing that we're having with the ill-fated FCC study in which they're asking, are news outlets giving the information as on the things Americans must know about. Well, what are the things Americans must know about? Pause a moment, because some people might not be aware of the brouhaha that just passed over. What was it that the FCC tried to do? The FCC regulates broadcasters, but it's not regulated newspapers. Uh, the FCC tried to have a study, or maybe still attempting to have a study, of how journalists arrive at news, how news bureaus and how editors select what is news, they had, uh, I think, seven areas which I, they, the FCC mm -hmm. deemed critical. And that is ludicrous, by the way, for a government agency to deem what is critical news or not. And, and lo and behold, amongst the critical areas, quote-unquote critical, were the environment, uh, were inequality, were things that to many others would not seem to be critical. Global warming would not be critical news to me. I think the market should decide what critical is. What I believe is that the left is still very sore about the fact that they have lost the monopoly on, on, on what news is. It is something that has poisoned the soul of progressives for some time now. You have three large areas of knowledge makers, and that is you know, entertainment, Hollywood, that is the academy, the universities, and that is media. While the left has a monopoly on entertainment and the academy, it's lost its monopoly on, on media. Well, a lot of it has to do with the business model of conventional newspapers, which collapsed with the death of classified advertising. One of the recommendations that the Brookings Institution Report makes to rebuild the investigative journalism capability of newspapers is that funders should step forward and endow journalists to protect them from pressure, sort of like endowing a tenured professor. What impact do you think this would have on the news? Well, I mean, I think that that's where we're going to go, by the way. What the Brookings writers leave out is the fact that the endowers, the people who make the endowments, will have a point of view. The people who endow ProPublica, are, for example, they have a point of view. The people who endow all the other new investigative journalist outlets all have a point of view. George Soros endows uh, NPR. He has a point of view. I have no, no problem with that, actually. I think that we should allow individuals who have money mm -hmm. to be able to endow news outlets uh, to do investigative work. That's just an extension of free speech. Is it important that the identity of the endower is known to the public, or, or would people have the right to anonymously endow journalists? I think the truth will out. We know, for example, uh, who endows ProPublica. It's, it's people with deep pockets who are left of center. We know that George Soros has given money to NPR, as, as long as there's transparency, and transparency will come out. Look, we will know, because of the way the news is angled, uh, people know that Talking Points Memo is, is an outfit of the left. The people know that Huffington Post is an outfit of, that is left of center. I, I have no problem with that, by the way. The left always has a problem with the right being able to speak. I have no problem with progressives being able to speak. So let the, let the market choose. Yes, let the market choose. And, and the market, by the way, chooses all the time which is one of the reasons why conservative talk radio is wildly popular, while progressive or liberal talk radio always fails. Do you, th do you think right-wing talk radio is persuasive? It certainly uh, speaks to the base. It certainly gives people affirmation for their views. But do you think it has any influence on the undecideds? Well, it's difficult for me to say. I'm a consumer of all types of news. I listen to NPR. I listen to talk radio. I listen to C-SPAN radio. Uh, it all depends on, on what I'm doing, uh, where I'm driving, and what show is on. I think that what we have right now is a, a veritable cornucopia of news, and I think that uh, people who are truly undecided sometimes do not really listen to news. The more you listen, the more you follow the news, the more you're engaged on an issue, the more decided you become over time. 
What do you think the long-term role is of the citizen journalist, not just the tweeter, not just the raw information, but a, a citizen who gets engaged in an issue, gets interested in an issue, begins both reporting and blogging about it, which includes a mix of facts and interpretation? What role do you think they have to play in the future of media? I think a citizen journalist will be everybody. Will be a banker, will be a student, will be uh, a, a man who stays at home and takes care of his children while his wife works will be a, a woman who stays, stays at home and takes care of her children while her husband works, will be a baker, anybody with an iPhone who passes a news event, who passes an event where there's police brutality, where passes an event where there's a crime being committed, and is able to record it in a, in, in a, on an iPhone or any kind of other smartphone as a video or a still image, and, and when he or she presses the send button, it gets, it gets broadcast to millions of people and to the world. And that is the ability we have today. We're no longer dependent on the, the Reuters, the, the, the photographer for the Reuters bureau chief or, or the cameraman at ABC News walking down the streets of Tehran who is there in the midst of news and records it and sends it to the world who will now be able to transmit this news and that, I think, we're all richer for it. We'll be able to have a lot more news. Those of us who are consumers of news will be very happy to have this increased supply of news. So you think the media power will move towards organizations who curate, compile, and make this accessible in an easy-to-digest format for people, given that the supply is going to become cheap and infinite? I think that we have – that's one business model. And I, I think we have seen, for example, with Real Clear. Uh, you know, uh, outfits that curate uh, and, and that aggregate do very well. They perform a, a market function, and they add value, and, and they can demand the price uh, for that mm -hmm. value that they add because they, they gather all these other things, and, and they give it. There's a one location where the consumer can go to. I think the, uh, the analyst and observer who takes a, a disparate news event and gives them a certain twist adds her insights to it and, and becomes known for that very perspicacious insight. And now lots of people will go to her site, and then, which is, I think is the case of Michelle Malkin, for example, and then she's able to draw mm -hmm. advertisers to her site, and then that's a good business model. I think we're moving rapidly away from the old business model, which was the seller of cereal, for example, or cars, mm -hmm. who advertised on newspapers in order to sell through this medium. Let me come back around to an issue raised in the Brookings paper, which was their warnings against the sin of false equivalence, the idea that journalists would give undue credibility to discredited views by trying to pretend to be fair and balanced. And one of the examples when I was speaking with Darrell West was giving airtime to global warming deniers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, Darrell West is, is simply the best. I didn't have to supply that example. He did it for me. <laughs> Actually, I set him up. I asked him what he thought of global warming deniers. And to his credit, he said, no, they shouldn't be given airtime. Well, that, that's not to his credit. <laughs> well, I credit his honesty. I don't say that I agree with him. Right, exactly. See, that's the genesis of the problem. Imagine if Galileo had not been given airtime, which the Catholic Church, and I'm a Catholic, by the way, I should say, had tried not to give Galileo. They said, no, 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 no. All the other planets circle the Earth. And your view is illegitimate. Your view shall not be given uh, any, any, any attention. Or the, or the flat earthers who thought, no, the world is flat. And any idea that the world is round should not be considered. Uh, that, that, is, that is the crux of the issue, according to the Daryl West of this world. It's funny that John Kerry used that example, claiming that the global warming deniers were the flat earthers, and therefore we shouldn't listen to them. It was just but, in the but news But they recently. always say that, but we don't care about what they say. We want them to say their things. We want them to give their opinion. We just want to be able to give ours. So I don't know how they claim the mantle of Galileo when they're the ones who try to shut down dissent. We don't care that they say the things they say. Different opinions should be able to compete in the marketplace of ideas. So, Mike, where do we go from here? Do you, do you think it's possible that politicians could regain control, put the genie back in the bottle, and begin manufacturing consensus that would allow them to continue growing the government? Yes, I think the government is, is, has a monopoly. It really, they really kind of do on, on physical harm. They are the ones with the guns. And I think that they can roll back technological advances 
We saw this with Greece and Rome. Uh, Greece and then Rome had incredible technological advances. We know because of the statues they left us that they were all clean-shaven, for example, whereas people in the Middle Ages had to grow beards. They did not have this technology anymore. Now, we saw an incredible turn back on advances for almost a thousand years in Europe because of ideology. So I think that definitely uh, politicians can put the genie back in the bottle, can slow down or make advances in media, go back to where they were. So I think it's very worrisome, and the, the population needs to be very alive, very, very awake to the fact that politicians may want to return to the bad old days when we were told what to think, we were told how to think it, and only uh, in, in what areas we were allowed to think. It's hard to imagine how they can do that in an era of prosperity. But certainly if our economic situation were to decline precipitously, uh, you know, as it did during the Great Depression or, or worse, or as it has now in, in places like Greece, uh, one can easily imagine the, a call for public order uh, reducing the number of voices that are heard. And so I guess our best defense against that is to get this economy back on track. And, and it doesn't have to be dramatic either. The, uh, the government can do many things at the margins that would curb our ability. They could, for example, allow uh, a monopoly in cable that would only allow the right, quote-unquote, types of news, the right type of information to come out. Fox News, uh, you, could, you could not have uh, permutations of Fox News, so Fox News itself could go away. What would happen then? What, what, what would be the, the, the voice, uh, the alternative voice? Well, I can't imagine them attempting to shut Fox News down without having there be such a hue and a cry that the blowback would cause more trouble than, than their efforts are worth. But uh, it sure is an experiment I don't want to see. <laughs> Me neither. You know, Mike, thank you so much for sharing your views. Let's continue the dialogue. It's, uh, it's nice actually to have both uh, Heritage and Brookings paired up yet again. We've had you, uh, the two of you before on the program and continue our discourse in a civil manner. Great. That's fantastic news. Thank you very much. That wraps up our show for this week. We've been talking to Mike Gonzalez, Vice President of Communications for the Heritage Foundation, responding to Dara West from the Brookings Institution. I'm your host, Bill Frezza, from Milk Radio Hour, brought to you by Competitive Enterprise Institute. You can listen to this and podcasts of all our previous shows at realcareradio.org. See you next week.